And with that, it's my absolute honor to pass the floor over to Kelly, who is going to introduce our incredible and wonderful pres presenters today. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much, Lisa. My name is Kelly Fitzgerald Hunko. My pronouns are she, her, and I am coming to you from Cape Coral, Florida, um, which is the land of the Calusa and Seminole peoples. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to in introduce our speakers today. Um, they are Pamela Rueda Devonport. Pamela is a certified life coach, recovery coach, and she recovers coach. For decades, she used alcohol as a way to self-medicate. Eventually, she quit through the 12 steps, but after five years of lackluster sobriety, she fell into a long, painful two-year relapse. Getting sober again, Pamela knew just sobriety wouldn't be enough. So she embarked on a journey to find the radical honesty and integrity she'd been missing. The result, Pamela found, founded My Badass Recovery in 2017, a no BS online platform that looks at recovery in a new way. Through online courses and coaching, she teaches people how to start a powerful sobriety and truly love the new version of themselves. Unapologetic, empowered, shame-free free, and badassing life in recovery. We also have Miriam Hernandez Lucena. Miriam is a bilingual alcohol-free coach, life coach from San Juan, Puerto Rico, serving health-conscious Latinas who wish to break free from the insidious and detrimental cycle of gray area drinking. As a former practicing attorney, busy mother of two, immersed within a culture of normalized heavy drinking, she was all too familiar with using alcohol as her main go-to for connecting with friends and colleagues, stress management, and even self-medication. For years, her life felt like an emotional roller coaster, an erratic dance between exhilaration, anxiety, languish, and depression, all cloaked under a guise of normalcy. It took deeply committing to redefining her relationship with alcohol to truly realize she was not only worthy of healing, but that it was entirely possible. As a now certified whole person coach and gray area drinking recovery coach, through her program, Diseñete Libre, Miriam offers a unique holistic approach to restoring your health and wellness by setting yourself free from alcohol, re-nourishing your brain and body, and reclaiming your most joyous and authentic self in the process. So it's my pleasure to allow Pamela and Miriam to take the floor. Thank you. Hola, hola. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Lisa and Miriam, for being here with me, um, and everyone really for showing up today. We are so excited when um, we were asked to, as part of Hispanic Heritage Month, talk a little bit about our culture. We were delighted. Hispanic Heritage Month spans from September the 15th to October the 15th, and it really celebrates the achievement and success of those who have come before us and those who are here today representing the marriage of you know, Hispanic culture in the US and in other parts of the world as we uh, hopefully motivate and encourage younger generations to reach high and achieve everything they want in this life by being their true selves as Hispanic people. So we were invited to talk about, um, you know, our culture. We are no experts <laughs> other than having the experience of, of course, being Latinas. And of course, as we develop this and realize that our stories were so different and yet so similar, we, we were thrilled because it is on that common thread that we truly find the opportunity to start piecing together, not just the challenges, which we'll talk about some of those today, but also the possibilities on how we can support each other, how we can build our community, how we can truly be stronger, and how even if you aren't Latina, I am for sure that you know some fabulous Latinas in your life. And so how can you support them as you either coach them, befriend them, embrace them, love them, talk to them? You know, Latinx is such a tremendously beautiful culture and we are all over. And uh, like I said, we have tremendous possibilities for, for growth in recovery, but we also face very specific challenges. And so today our goal is to share those, to create that awareness, to share those challenges, and not just to support each other as Latinas, but to also give you guys a little bit of a taste, a little bit of education, and of course, a few resources 
to learn more about us and how you can support us as well. So um, on a personal note, I am freaking thrilled to be here because you may have followed my path. Two months ago, I got uh, sick with shingles and my ear got affected and my face got paralyzed. And so now I'm talking a little bit funky and my world is still spinning a little bit. I'm still suffering with vertigo. So if you see me kind of tugging at something or if all of a sudden my brain stops and I start, you know, talking about pineapples, you got to just take a deep breath and be there with me. <laughs> Anyway, let's have some fun. Let's talk a little bit of what it is to be Latina. Because when I say Latina, you may be thinking about, I don't know, maybe Salma Hayek or JLo or Frida Kahlo, or maybe you're thinking of women who change the world like Isabel Allende. There's actually two incredible uh, precedents uh, these days um, in Argentina. Um, ooh, uh, in Argentina and somewhere else in, in the US, in, in Latin America, just killing it as women. And of course, um, there's, you know, OAC, and there's so many women who are just paving the path. My mother, Miriam's mother, I mean, come on, these are women that are changing the world. We come from so many places, though, and we are thought of as, you know, Latinas as a whole and as a bucket. But the truth is, we come from incredibly different countries. Um, we come from Peru, from Nicaragua, from uh, Venezuela, Colombia, Mexico, Costa Rica, Paraguay, Chile, Argentina, and even Spain. I mean, we are from all over Mexico, Puerto Rico, of course. And not only are we diverse because of our different countries and the beauty and challenges of our own countries, but we also, you know, may be people who emigrated to the U.S. And so, you know, there's also the, the, the differences and the diversity and the beautiful cultural nuances of the people who have come to this country and embrace the, you know, the culturation, the acculturation of living here as immigrants. And so I say this because sometimes we think of Latin people and we think, oh, you know, they're, they're all people and they are all, you know, similar and all the same. And the truth is we aren't. It's funny, Miriam and I talking, we have uh, for sure many things that, that are different in the way that we were raised and our beliefs and our country and our vision of the world. Um, but at the same time, even as diverse as we are, and we have to embrace this diversity, especially when it comes to how do we support someone from this country versus from that country living in the US, for example, we are very different. It's crazy how many similarities we have. As a culture, we share what we call common values, core values, if you wish. And it's in these core values that we truly find the opportunity to start understanding a little bit more as a whole, what makes up our culture so rich and so, well, so, so, so Latin, right? So I'm gonna name a couple of the, of the values that I believe are foundational to start understanding us as a people. Um, we believe that Latin people share a uh, high level of respect, respect for each other, respect for the world, respect for structure. Uh, we are people who are honest. We are humble. We are hardworking. That's one of the values that we are so proud of. We are proud. We are proud of where we come from and who we are, even if our upbringing and our country is sometimes faced with difficult challenges, political, you know, drug wars, economical, socioeconomical. We still, as people, are fiercely loyal to where we come from and our roots. We do believe that we are um, you know, a special kind of people. We are all family in that sense. We are very, very proud of our roots. Um, we, are, we are resilient. And this means that we are, we are that tree that gets bent in 20,000 different storms and we don't break. And all of this is fantastic, as you will learn in a little bit as we continue to dive into it. It is also one of the things that is a little bit of a barrier on how we, we detect and how we can help ourselves when it comes to our mental health. But at the core of all of these values, we have familismo. Familismo comes, as you can hear, from family. Our core center world is that our world revolves around the unit of family. Now, this is fantastic because it, all, it means basically that we, 
we come from a strong family background to which we are loyal, we are committed, we find our compass for right and wrong, good and bad in the in the nest of our family, in the core of our home. And this is this really is good in the sense that we are not people that are, you know, kind of isolated and unsupported. We truly grow in community. Now, this also can be a little difficult because we are less independent than, for example, our United States or Canada or European counterparts. We kind of, for the most part, and again, please know that everything that I'm saying, I'm saying half of out of experience and then half of kind of a generalization. There's always, of course, development of, you know, generations as we grow up and there's always, you know, you can't stereotype, but in general, because our family strength and lineage is so strong that also poses a little bit of a challenge especially for latina women when it comes to finding their place outside of the family so we have a little bit of this tug of war like we see for example me and i know miriam is a little different but for me i kind of grew up looking at my at the female, my female counterpart, so to speak, in the US, you know, with all the movies and all the culture that we imbibe coming from our northern, you know, parts of the world, Canada, the US, and, and of course, Europe and whatnot. And I would want to be that, you know, that that woman that was strong, like the breadwinner, the one that got the equal pay, the badass executive. And that was like my vision. But then you are home and you're still kind of taught values about you know, being part of the home, you know, we, we were, I was at least, I think the generation as at least in Mexico, that was starting to break that lineage generationally from my abuela, you know, my grandmothers and my mother, even, you know, who were doing a fantastic job in raising children and, and standing for themselves, but still the, the nuance of the family continues to be, you know, the mother stays at home and works and raises the children. The father is the breadwinner. And as a girl that is raised in that environment, my job was a little bit to be strong like my father, be kind and compassionate and amazing like my mother, but also kind of, you know, find my place in a society that was, you know, the tug of war. And so when you are constantly pulled in all directions from the world outside and then the world inside, and then you realize that whatever you do is a representation of the pride and the honor and I guess the perception and the standing of your family, it gets a little tricky because remember, one of the core values was resilience. So what happens when a Latina, no matter where, let, let's say just any youth of Latinos, you know, we, we start to experience mental health issues or challenges that can develop in mental health issues, because I already explained a little bit of that tug of war, but it gets a little muckier because what happens when you take that young person and you bring them to the US or the people who have emigrated here and you know they are raised here, all of a sudden the tug of war on finding the, the huge difference between the world outside and then the nucleus of their home and their family and their community with somewhat old fashioned values, that tug of war and that separation becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And as we all know, that separation becomes painful. And so when issues of separation and pain and mental health develop, Latin youth, Latinas, we have a really hard time, a really hard time. First, naming it, understanding what the hell is going on with us, you know, the shame Shame, I didn't actually mention it, but shame and obedience are also statistically, we saw it in books as we were doing research. They are some of the core values of Latin people. And so obedience and shame are used to kind of keep people in, you know, in the core of what's right and wrong based on the family. And so as youth start to develop and as we start to, you know, perhaps with the separation, feel the need for some mental health support because we are developing issues, then what do you do then? What happens? You know, that's a little bit of what, what this conversation really is, is trying to highlight. We deal with inner 
issues within our home, ourselves, and even our own minds. Because again, how do you put language to things that you don't really know when your family and your culture and your society, who again, remember, they're resilient, they're family-based, and they're religious. There's a high level of religiousness also. And you don't want to be the, the black sheep, right, who goes out there and states that, you know, you're struggling with depression, or you need therapy, or Lord forbid, you have an addiction, because then you're a little bit of la loca, or la borracha, or, you know, it's, it's hard, because it represents, it's a stigma, that we all have stigma, and I get it. But in our culture, the stigma is a representation of the well being and the honor of the family. And that's hard. I'm going to tell you a little bit of my story just to to show how little we grow up knowing. I'm very grateful because I had a great and very global um, education growing up. My parents really did an incredible job at raising me, sending me to, you know, the best schools they could. They had me travel the world. I spoke three languages by the time I was, you know, 13 years old. And so you would think that in all of this education and knowledge, I would have at least a clue of how to handle my own well-being, my physical health and my mental health. But the truth is, I didn't have a clue. When I was 20 years old, um, again, some of the challenges of our country create a lot of wreckage in our hearts. In my case, I was kidnapped in Mexico. I was kidnapped, yes, straight out of a Hollywood movie. They literally walked inside of my house. They, uh, they plucked me from the family home. They took me for ransom, you know, guns, knives, you know, the blindfold, it, just the whole shebang. I'll write a book about it one day. And when I was given back to my family, fortunately, unharmed, and I can't even imagine what my poor mom and dad went through at that point. But um, at that point, I, you know, I was on survival mode. Remember, resilient, resilient, proud, religious, and fundamented by the love and support of my family. And so those were my tools. So my, my dad and my mom took us, my brother and I basically just, you know, we got on a plane and we moved to the US for safety. Basically, I was just like evicted from my country. From one day to another, my world changed. At no point in time during the next few months or even years, but especially during the next few months, at no point in time did I ever say, I think I need to talk to someone about this. It never even crossed my mind that I desperately needed therapy. It never crossed my parents' mind. And it's not because they weren't good parents, of course not. But again, we were raised to think that enough love and enough inner communication in our little nest is enough. And it wasn't. What happened for me is I started to have a lot of bad dreams, a lot of nightmares. My codependence kicked in. That is another one of my struggles. And my codependence said, don't let them know that you're not okay. I protected them by throwing myself under the bus. I had no idea what was happening. And so my resource was to drink. The more I drank, oh, and also, and Miriam will tell you a little bit more about that, but in our culture, it is accepted that you drink at an early age. It is unlike here, kind of one of those things, you know, in the US, maybe they, as a kid, they have you try an exotic, you know, meal as a sign of, oh, let's get them out of the mac and cheese. Let's have them try something so that they grow up and, you know, elevate their taste. Well, for us, it was the same, but with a little glass of wine. Oh, oh, let them grow up. <laughs> and so, um, so again, from an early age, this was unknown to them, just one of those things that really damaged our, you know, development, I believe. And so, uh, so anyway, so I started drinking a lot. And before I knew it, I had issues. So, so realize the snowball that that is happening in my in my Latin well educated family, right, full of love and full of everything. But yet, here's a girl that's developing a tremendous response to trauma to a really highly traumatic event, not just for me, but for the whole family, the whole family should have gone to therapy. Now I am deplaced. I'm in a different country. I don't understand what the fuck is happening around me or how to communicate or who I am. So now I have issues of tremendous separation. I am using alcohol to anesthetize all of my pain, but I don't really know, you know, that this is not okay. It's just kind of like what we do. It's okay, I suppose. I don't know. Yeah. And over the next, you know, 10 and a half, 10 or 15 years, it developed into a really, really bad, bad alcoholism you know, just really bad. 
And then, of course, the codependency of I, I'm not important so long as I keep moving on. Every, the whole family was going to be okay. So you can tell how many layers of complex there is to that. And so Miriam is going to tell her story. It's a little different um, for sure. But uh, we will dive into you know, more of what these challenges are presented because in my story, there are so many buttons that I touched of all of the cultural scenarios that again, bring us beauty, but bring us challenges and hopes that we can start to raise this conversation and support better the people that come from countries from Latin America or Spanish speaking. So Miriam, I pass the baton a ti, mamacita. <laughs> Gracias, Pamela. Thank you very much for having me. I, I feel honored to be sharing this virtual space with you all. Um, so as you can imagine, I identify with a lot of the things that Pamela has already touched on as it relates to being Latina and the expectations that are often placed on Latina women and also that uh, morally charged framework around what is mental health and emotional well-being uh, directly linked to family and community within the Latino community. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about my story, um, but I invite you to try to identify what are those places uh, in my story where you find similarities, intersections with Pamela's? And when do we differ? When are things feeling uh, differently? Uh, because one of the most beautiful things about this type of conversation, and Pamela already touched on that, is that uh, the Latinx community is a huge pool of various, various, various types of people and worldviews and world experiences. Of course, we as Latinos, we and, and or Latinx, we identify with a collective identity, but there are nuances and there are marked differences depending on your country of origin, even your local or regional traditions. Um, your race, your gender, uh, social economic status, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So many factors come into play. So just keeping an open mind and an open heart and leaving our assumptions and stereotypes aside can actually just, you know, enhance all of this experience beautifully. Um, so a little bit about myself. I was born and raised in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And uh, for those of you who do not know, or maybe most of you know, Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory. We have been a U.S. territory uh, since 1896. Um, but despite of our economic and social and political relationship to the states, here in Puerto Rico, we have maintained and defended and just retained our Latin American culture. Uh, Everything is in Spanish, our institutions, um, our food, our traditions, our core values as, as Latin Americans are uh, seemingly, you know, untouched, um, somewhat influenced, obviously, by our relationship with the states, but we are purely Latin American, right, as, as we feel in our hearts that we are. And another important aspect about Puerto Rico as it pertains to the experience of the Hispanics in the U.S., we have uh, three point something million Puerto Ricans living in the island and 5.6 million Puerto Ricans living in the United States. We are the second largest Hispanic group uh, right under Mexicans in the US. So uh, I believe because of this, we are a, a very important a group to be integrated within the conversation of what it means to be Latino and what are the needs for this community, right? Um, so my father, a little bit of more personal notes, uh, my father, he was a music teacher, a musician, and he was a teacher at the high school where I, I studied, and an avid uh, reader of history books. He even had this room in our house that he called El Cuarto de los Libros, or the room of books, uh, so you can imagine. And my mom, she was a working mother and not only working mother, she was a professor in the Faculty of Education in the University of Puerto Rico. So you can imagine how important education, academia, uh, just you know, going up that academic ladder and, and eventually having a profession, how important that was and how it was placed in the forefront when I, and during my upbringing. Uh, and I felt that more so than my brothers because I was the firstborn, and so you can imagine. <laughs> um, so, but despite of that education, 
oftentimes education is confused with being being entirely knowledgeable and having full awareness and it's not it's not like that at all in my house although both of my parents were educated people they had a very limited and stigmatized views of what it, mental health meant and emotional well-being and for me specifically i i was a very emotional highly sensitive uh just very in, very emotional human being as a little girl and growing up uh, eventually in my upbringing so it felt like a very essential part of who i was was being neglected because the priority was the practicality of moving forward and of achieving and i'm checking all the boxes right uh, as a concern to education and profession and so but the thing is although i'm saying i felt neglected um when i went to my friend's house when i went to a cousin's house when i went to other family members houses the pattern repeated itself so the, the parents were not necessarily putting in the forefront um that the importance of let me check on my children's mental and emotional well-being they the adults weren't doing it for themselves as pamela already uh talked about how how she believes her whole family unit right uh needed a therapy at that time and did not get it so it was the same for me and when you see a pattern all around you culturally in your community you point the fingers at yourself you become very very self critical about how you do not feel the mold of a fit the mold of what is expected of you and uh that's a very very tough place to be in right and then add to that um yes as pamela already mentioned we love communion connection family here in 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 with my family uh, before the pandemic every single chance we got multiple times a year to really come together aunts uncles cousins we we did that all throughout me being raised but every single family activity there was alcohol present and there was heavy drinking and also it was not frowned upon for you to have 15 16 years old and have your glass it's a, a type of rite of passage uh you know uh, uh, in, in that sense and then i started to gain this narrative around oh alcohol lets me set loose a little bit of this restriction that i feel going on in my upbringing it it allows me to feel looser and to connect with other family members and even to to dive into uh just dissolving the authoritarian relationship that you would have with your adult counterparts and just chill with them through alcohol and on top of that it was in these family gatherings where the stigma began where i started hearing people gossiping about la loca el loco they would start talking about far relatives or people not even within the family as people that were crazy without any gray area they were crazy labeled with just a direct automatic assumption and the reason why this would happen would be twofold you would have people that were labeled as loco or loca because they were living out their mental illness their obvious mental illness out in the open so i got the message you only look for help right or you when when the bomb has already exploded there is no in between right if you're functioning and if you are productive it is admired in the latino community to just keep pushing forward so and the other reason why people would say la loca o el loco especially towards women like disproportionately more towards women la loca it would be because that woman in particular would decide to walk off the beaten path in some way shape or form she was um not conformed with the norm within the the, the latin american uh, culture or in my case the puerto rican uh, family standards so you can imagine how all of this plays out when i began experiencing a lot of mental and emotional instability because i was checking all those functioning productive boxes and it, it wasn't a smooth ride but i i did do the deed of completing my academics eventually i became an attorney so that was all there yet 
inside, I was feeling very, very unstable. And as a gray area drinker, I had a problematic yet normalized relationship with alcohol. So what, what were those internal barriers that were keeping me from actually looking for help before I did? I, I decided to tackle the piece of alcohol and eliminate alcohol from my life when I was 30 seven years old. I had been drinking since I was 14. And after I dissolved that, that, that obstacle, I looked for psychological help for the first time in my life, already a mother of two and a professional. And it was the best decision of my life. But I had to go over some internal barriers. And now I want to uh, stray away a little bit from myself and talk about in general, what are those common internal barriers that Latina women may experience? And Pamela touched on it beautifully. One of them is stigma. What I talked about, la loca, el loco, the deep seated fear, horrible fear of being labeled that label and also how it shows upon your family. So if you are functioning and you're being productive, and you don't have a chronic, full-blown, obvious addiction going on, you are drinking normally, you're going to uh, do an exercise of risk or cons. Should I risk being labeled? You won't risk it, right? So that's a barrier. And then the other things is shame and guilt, both emotions that are tied within the Latinx community to deep Catholic historical roots. Independently of about whether you uh, know a, a Latino person that is not practicing Catholic, our, many of our core values, including obedience, are linked to our Catholic uh, uh, historical roots. So shame and guilt also uh, keep you from moving forward and reaching out. And also an individual and a community, uh, especially in marginalized or low-income communities, uh, a lack of knowledge about what is mental health. In the Latinx community, people are constantly talking about physical ailments and, and physical health back and forth, no matter the, the, the social class or, or education level. You, everybody's talking about, Ay, me duele por aquí. Ay, tengo un dolorcito por acá. That's, but a lot, but people, a lot of them are not aware of what is mental health and what treatment and support can look like for them. So why would you look for a support that you don't even know what it looks like or what it is or what it can do for you, right? And then lastly, another internal barrier, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass the baton to Pamela because it, it somewhat starts hitting on the systemic barriers more than the individual. Lack of resources. You can find yourself a person from the Latinx community that has already decided that despite the stigma, the shame, the guilt, they are going to get the support that they so desperately need. But then boom, they look at their bank account, they do not have resources, they are not insured, et cetera, et cetera. So that is also a very important uh, internal barrier that we should look into. Um, so I'm, I'm going to pass, uh, pass uh, uh, to pa Pamela for a little bit because I think it's a beautiful moment to then speak about those systemic barriers that keeps us from, from looking for support as Latinas. Beautiful, thank you, Miriam. Well, it's it's interesting because as I mentioned, the challenges of a person who still lives in their country of origin are a little bit different than the uh, the person who has moved, who has migrated to other countries. In my particular case, um, you know, I'm exposed to being a Latin in the U.S. And one of the things that, that we have to consider, especially if we get back into this idea that as a community, as a She Recovers community, the hope is that we ourselves, every single person here, the coaches, all of us start to understand a little bit more how we can go about this. We have to understand what's really happening because systemically, the biggest, I, we think that one of the biggest factors is the lack of resources in our own language. It is very, very difficult to find the language for mental health issues, as Miriam was beautifully pointing out. So imagine if you're going to be finding that way of communicating if you yourself don't have you know, the resources if you're in your own language. And so for a, a Latin 
person for a Latina growing up in Canada or in the US, you know, they're fighting so many things. And then they, they finally take that leap and they take that risk that Miriam was talking about. And then the resources out there for the most part are not in Spanish. Or if they are in Spanish, I hate to say it, but it's nothing but words. It is nothing but, you know, there is no true understanding of the culture behind. And so this is one of the most beautiful places of opportunity for us, because it is going to be very difficult for me to understand historically the experience of someone who may be, you know, African American or, or, or from, you know, a community of, of Native Americans, because I didn't grow up there, but I can educate myself, I can start to understand, okay, what are the factors that play in here? Because based on everything that we just shared systemically, we can provide resources based on, okay, maybe this person is saying that they, they feel nervous. Well, they're really not feeling nervous. They're really suffering from anxiety. Maybe they're talking about, you know, just, just, just being sad and you have to understand that they're just trying to set sad, but it's going to be okay. It's okay. It's okay. And then you realize, wow, maybe this person truly is fighting depression, but not only that, they're, they're tossing it to the side or they're minimizing it because of the terrible, terrible lack of support in their house to deal with this. And then where do they go? So out there, it is very hard when, you know, there's high levels of poverty and at the level of Latinos in the US, 19% don't even have resources of health insurance or even more these days. The stats that we have are a couple of days, a couple of years old. Um, the legal status of people, that is another huge barrier. Would you go and try to seek help for something when you don't know if La Migra is going to ICE? is something that may be, you know, wrapped in this conversation of who you are when you go and you fill out a form to try to get some, some help for anything that you're struggling with. How terrifying is that? You know, and then the, um, you know, this, this seeking therapy, seeking help to a provider, to any kind of support and having them not really be able to point you in the right direction because the resources that are available are not forefront. You, We found some resources, but it took work. It wasn't easy. We found one podcast that talked about, you know, Latin health in the US in their own language. And this, this discrimination, so to speak, that comes with, you know, having those resources be hidden because then we feel, well, if there's not a lot of, resources out there, it must be because, you know, there's nothing wrong with me, or it's not valid, or it's too expensive, or, you know, it's just not easy. And so for us, again, we're not experts in this field, right? We are just trying to, we're scratching the, the tip of the iceberg, but it is fascinating to us because this is an experience that both Miriam and I had, her with her, what she describes as her gray area drinking. For me, it began I don't know if it really began like that because I drank pretty heavily from the very beginning. But the point is, it took us a really long time to first find the language and then go find the resources. And I have to say, for me, I found resources in English and I was lucky that I spoke in English. And then even if I if I understood the language and people understood me, it was very difficult because at the core, I still felt like they didn't get me. Or even worse, there was discrimination. I cannot tell you how many times I have said, well, yeah, you know, in my family, I started drinking when I was 15. And literally people will look at me like, what the hell was wrong with your parents? And the truth is nothing was wrong with my parents. Nothing. It's my whole country. It's my whole society. It's Puerto Rico. You just said it. In fact, Miriam and I were talking. If Miriam would go up to her family and say, no, today I, I, I'm not drinking Uncle Julio. Uncle Julio would be like, no, and put a drink in her hand because it is like, it is absolutely insane that somebody would nix the family traditions by not partaking in the ritual of drinking. And I get that all of us, you may be nodding your head and thinking, yeah, that happens to me and I'm not Latina. But because this is ingrained from us from, you know, 13, 14, 15, then it truly, you don't, you don't get that discernment of what is right and what is wrong. So 
busting the bubble and the stigma internally, and then going outside to seek help and having, you know, health insurance issues, uh, Spanish or no Spanish issues, lack of acculturation, lack of understanding, lack of cultural competence, immigration issues, you know, all of these fears, we're, we're stuck. What do you do? You make yourself chiquita and you make yourself calladita. You make yourself small and you make yourself quiet and you continue perpetuating that cycle of shame. Our job, certainly for Miriam and I, and for anyone who wants to start joining this conversation, is to start opening and embracing our arms wide open, wide open to this idea that we are just going to continue this conversation about recovery as something that has no stigma, no shame, and in fact, makes us women of power that really, really allows for us to heal powerfully and to impact through our actions and our healing, all of the people, all of the generations of Latinas and Latinos who come in the same, you know, in the same scenario as us. So that's the beginning of the conversation. We are very passionate about it. We have a bunch of statistics. Miriam put together a beautiful list of resources to share with you guys. And we, of course, are open to any questions that you may have. But again, the exciting thing is, is that we are just beginning to scratch the surface of what we can do together for this beautiful community of ours. And even in November, we are going to have a big surprise for you guys because we are going to start rolling out a She Recovers in Espanol so that we can truly start being the change for that community, that desperately, of our community, that is desperately needing more support and more recovery. Wow. So incredible. I feel like we could stay in this space for many, many, many more hours Yeah. Um, because you both have just shared with us some incredibly heart opening and mind opening um, it, personal experiences. But, I, you know, a, as as a white woman, you know, who, who desires to be a supportive person in this community, I have a great deal to learn, like I shared at the, at the beginning. And it's conversations like these that help me realize, you know, the, the, the individual or the internal barriers that you're, that you're sharing with us so courageously and vulnerably. So thank you for that. Um, but also the external and the societal barriers, right. And what our community and our societies and our, and our countries, you know, need to do to do better by, by all Latino women and all, all women and people of color. So, Thank you for leaving me with more questions than I, you know, than I have answers. That's what I always long for. So I deeply appreciate that. But, you know, I see you both as incredible women of power. Um, and I just love that you use that term to, to identify because that is absolutely what you are. The presence that you hold and the way that you're able to share your lived experience. We, I mean, I've heard, I've heard you both say, you know, I'm not an expert, but the, you know, what I'm hearing is that you've both endured a great amount of, of barriers of, uh, you know, internal issues again, with your being able to access mental health, as well as the ex external barriers. Um, and there is no greater education, right. Than, than living through yeah. that experience. And so again, just so deeply grateful for your willingness to like step forward and transform that pain into purpose um, and, and, and be willing to, to educate us today, right? Like just, there's just no greater gift that we could receive. Um, and I, I believe too, that you're, you know, by having this conversation, there are Latina um, women, you know, in this community that are hearing this maybe for the first time that, you know, you, you step forward and, and you're recovering out loud. Um, and it's inspiring them to know that they can, you know, there, there may be some tools out there, whether it be a community like She Recovers or some of the resources you're going to share with the community to say no to that uncle, right? Or to be able to, yeah. to leave the home <laughs> and, and build a culture of recovery that supports their mental health, right? But and I, yeah. I don't want to take up too much air from the room because we've got about 10 minutes left and some great questions um, coming forward. But the kind of the one that I have before I pass it over to Kelly is... Um, you know, there, we, we all know that in recovery and, and addiction and mental health issues, there's already so much stigma, right? Just in that, in, in that experience itself. And so what I'm hearing is that there's not only these barriers, but there's also, you know, extra barriers for Latina women based on the culture in the home or like that, um, don't air your dirty laundry in public, right? Which in the addiction side of things, we might say, don't talk, don't trust, don't feel, right? There's all of these things at play, even from a cultural perspective, right? Um, 
and so I guess what I'm wondering is, you know, you've both spoken about how you, your personal experience and how you were actually able to smash some of that stigma and step into to your courage, identify that you had a need or something to heal. Um, and so what are some of the first steps that you took as individuals and, and what were some of the most um, prominent resources or moments or people or spaces that helped you begin to heal? Uh, my, my, and I have to admit that my way of recovering was quite exceptional in the sense that I recovered within the pandemic situation, but I believe it tells a lot. It points to important wisdom. I recovered isolated. I did not have the voices of people on top of me getting into my process because everybody was quarantined here in Puerto Rico. We had really strict um, uh, uh, executive orders pl in place. So in a, in a sense, I very much felt I was in this cocoon and had the opportunity to listen to my own voice and start to take those first steps towards recovery. So how that, that can be translated in the real world where you do intermingle actively and consistently with your family members and with, and with friends and with society, that's a very interesting aspect of it. Uh, how can you, because it is important for Latina women to give themselves the permission to follow yes, their yes. own voice. This Ugh. is, yes. Yes. So Pamela, if you want to, if you want to add a little bit to that. Yeah. I, I think that what you said is brilliant. And for me, Lisa, I had to, uh, for me, I had to go to the deep end. I mean, my, I was, I drove my son drunk as a skunk and I, like, I could have killed him. Like literally for me. I was, I'm not gray area. I didn't know. I had to reach the deep bottom and fear for my son's life for this to really hit me. Uh, the beautiful thing is, is I found a group of support and I found people who gave me the language. And once I had the language and the understanding of what this was and the separation from shame to actual disease and what I was struggling with, I was able to then talk to my parents who in all of their love said, oh shit, we knew that something was wrong, but now we know. And having the certainty of what was going on for me gave me, like Miriam said, the permission to then talk, talk honestly to them without asking them permission, but telling them that I was healing. And then they embraced it completely and it validated everything. So I think that was the biggest thing for me. Somebody, I think Soraya put in the, uh, in the chat that she identified with some of the terminology that we use, the la loca, la borracha, blah, 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 because that's, I think, again, talking to people that get you, that's, and understand, that was core for me at the beginning as well. Wow, and just, and just a reflection of how individualized it can be, right, to, yes. to incredibly different, but incredibly sure. similar experiences, so, for sure, um, just absolutely incredible, thank you so much for that response, I'm going to pass it over to Kelly, and then we do have some excellent questions to bring forward from the community. I won't take up too much time because I want to have you answer more questions, but I just had so many reflections and this is so needed for all the recovery community, but especially for She Recovers. Um, and as a white woman who lived in Mexico for five years and got sober there, I have a semi-unique experience, but it's obviously nothing compared to first person experience and growing up in a Latinx community. Um, but what I did want to comment was that my husband who is Mexican was telling me about when he was a young kid, he used to make the drinks for his family members. They used to ask him like, he was like six, seven, eight years old. Hey, go grab me this drink or go make me a Paloma or whatever it may be. And he took some sips of it. And he, again, drank <laughs> from a young age. Um, and it was just normal. It was normal. And I, I even as someone who's sober and he is, he is not sober, um, but he did quit a lot of his drinking after I got sober, but I even looked at him and said, wow, that's really crazy. Like that's some serious <laughs> stuff. So I had the same type of stereotypical like reaction, even though I'm someone who had to quit myself um, with that, that um, way of life and growing up in that in that environment. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just ask one quick question, even though I have a bunch, cause I don't want to take up too much time, but I hear um, through your presentations that there's the language barriers, there's the stigma, there's the cultural incompetence, as you said, Pamela, which is so important. Um, so what do you think is the number one thing that needs to be worked on right now to honor the Latinx 
experience and provide more resources for women um, who need recovery right now. I mean, I don't know that we can go and change the world systemically, obviously, but our first step and what we can do as a community for starters is to start having this awareness, right? I think that, I mean, even myself, when we were doing research on how to bring our experience home with some more specific information, and I started to see how, how incredibly important those core values have really shaped our experience of first of, you know, not being able to, to heal and then healing and how, you know, how many barriers there were, even myself, I was like, Oh, my goodness. So our job, I think immediately is to start really to start educating our community. Because, you know, Kelly, you may have you know, you have your husband and you grew up and you may have a little bit more context, but even if you did it, you can say, oh, you know what, this sounds like this, or, oh, or at least you know who to refer them to. Hey, this is a great podcast. Hey, this is a great therapist. Hey, we have, you know, we have a community of Spanish. All of a sudden you open a door, just like we open a door only some people to she recovers because we know somebody there is going to be able to provide something for that someone who's desperately in need. So for us immediately, we believe the first thing is to begin this awareness, to begin this conversation and to continue educating ourselves. And we say we're not experts because, you know, I mean, for two seconds there, I forgot that it was Brazil that has the female president. I mean, I'm supposed to know these things, but there is so much for us to learn, so much for us to give. Miriam, did you have any comment on that? Yeah, very quickly, when it comes to the... To to coaching itself, recovery coaching itself. I think all coaches, including uh, Latina coaches within She Recovers, including us, we all need to do the work together, right? Of how can we provide uh, cultural, culturally competent and racial, racially conscious support? Because within the Latinx community, uh, mm -hmm. there is a diversity also in race, in gender, gender identity. There are a lot of intersections. So. And anything that does not coincide with what is Pamela as a Latina and her experience and me as a Latina and my experience, we also need to do the work, right? Of what it means to be uh, 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 a Black Latina. Diverse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and we could do this together. It's, and, and She Recovers obviously provides a beautiful, beautiful community and platform to start the conversation as Pamela says. Beautiful. Thank you both so much for that. And like, and like Pamela said as well, we are excited to bring forward um, more, it, actually even in general, more language specific gatherings and offerings, but specific to the Latina women in our community. Um, we're very excited to bring forward um, that space and that gathering opportunity at the end of November. Um, some great questions coming through for you here um, in the Q&A. Um, one of them is, I know you both mentioned the stigma from your family about trying to seek mental health and addiction help. Have you made progress with your families in this sense? Do you have their support or do you feel still stigmatized by them? I can speak a little bit about that on that. Um, my mother uh, has reached out herself for mental health support. It, it took my father passing in 2018 and the pandemic to hit. So again, this notion of the bomb has to explode and then I'll get the help. But she's there, she got there. So as and from my personal standpoint, it's out in the open. We, we feel comfortable enough to talk openly about this, definitely. But you do feel a difference in the generations. Uh, we're having the conversation, but you can feel that maybe her hombros or shoulders go up a little bit with the topic and I'm more relaxed about it, but, but definitely we, there's been progress. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And again, her story and my story are so different because my recovery started in 2009. And so it's been many, many years. And from the get go, my mother, my father, my brother immediately said, how can we help? Like it, it was like, they had seen the problem, but I justified, Oh, you just see me drinking a lot because every time you visit me, that's when I can let loose. And it wasn't true. I was drinking myself to death as a single parent by herself here in the US alone with her child. And that was really, really not okay. 
And so from the very beginning, they embraced me. And now they've gotten, I think their biggest challenge is to just get comfortable with the fact that I have this platform. I have my Badass Recovery podcast. I go around the world. Like, this is my thing. Like, I literally put a shirt, like, sober badass bitch. Like, I'm, and of course, I drop a lot of F-bombs. And I share a lot of, you know, with discretion, with respect for them. But I share a lot of what happens with their permission because I believe that these conversations, you know, just need to be transparent so that we can help other people, period. We cannot talk about ditching sh stay, uh, shake, <laughs> stigma and shame. See what I did there? I mixed it. If we don't do it ourselves. And so, uh, so no, my family has been super supportive. Yeah. And what I'm hearing too, is that it, it, for, for many things, the healing journey, you know, regardless of whatever feedback or support you may have given really did also start with you and that you're recovering out loud for you. And I, and I appreciate the invitation, Pamela, that you've, um, you know, received um, their a, a approval, you know, to some degree for, for recovering with, yeah. you know, their, their involvement in your story, but, but also that we can recover out loud just by our own experience, right. And by sharing who, Absolutely. who we are and, and yeah, at our own I think, Mi level, right? yeah, Miriam said it beautifully earlier, we have to give permission to ourselves first and foremost, because whether our family supports us or not, well, that is beautiful. And it is very helpful. At the same time, and I hate just how it sounds, because it's going to sound rude, but it doesn't fucking matter. Like we need to heal, we need to do this for ourselves. We just need to do it for ourselves. Our, our parents, our children, our spouses, they can be great motivators but it is us that we need to claim first, the beauty of our life. And so hopefully that is at the core of this message for sure. It absolutely is because as a recovering codependent, I'm, I'm being reminded again, right? Of the work that I do on myself can potentially impact other people, but that's not the, the primary reason, right? Why I do it, I do it for me. So thank absolutely. you for that reminder. Yeah. Um, somebody else has asked, um, as a Nicaraguan American woman, I've had challenges finding other Latinas in recovery or first generation Latinas in recovery? Do you have any resources or tips on how I can expand my community? Miriam, you have a bunch of resources. Yes, I, I don't know what the, I, I prepared uh, two lists. One has a list of uh, resources as it relates to mental health in the Latinx community, and the other one with resources uh, surrounding recovery. Um, so again, they're few and far between, but this conversation has been going on for quite a while and even more so within the psychology, psychiatry arena. Uh, YouTube, for example, is a universe uh, of resources in the, in the sense of the institutions, the official institutions that are, are having these conversations. But uh, Lisa, I don't know what is the best way that you believe for the attendees to get the, the resources that I've compiled together. So. Yeah, so just so everyone who is tuning in um, to the live into the recording, uh, we will be adding all of these resources to the event page on the She Recovers website. So you can just go and look up the um, Breaking Barriers for Latina Mental Health there. Um, it'll also be shared in our She Recovers Support for Black, Indigenous, and Women of Color um, Facebook group. Um, and then, of course, when we do have our first of hopefully what is many gatherings, um, it, the resources can be shared there as well. So there's a few different touch yeah. points. So I'm happy to receive all of those for the people who are tuning in. Um, and I do note, I didn't even keep an eye on the time like I usually do. It's five minutes after noon, my time. So we are going to start to close up here. Um, thank you, everybody, for all of your brilliant questions. Uh, the last one that I have here is, as a white woman living in a Latina community, how can I help? Mm. For starters, your open heart, your being here, you're asking that question is already magnificent. So thank you. Um, stick with us, stick with us, um, go and see the resources that Miriam is going to share, you know, that we're going to share. I think it is eye opening to understand with how little you can do so much. I think the first thing is ask the questions and have the compassion that there's many layers of challenges beneath what you see. Because if they're here, that means that, you know, they came from a different country or they were raised from, from people from a different country. And that alone is a lot of trauma and separation. So a lot of compassion and, and how can you help them? You know, that's, the, that's really the conversation. And if you meet someone that, you know, not your case, but if, if you were to meet someone who still lives over there, know that for the majority of us, we come from countries that are struggling. You know, we, I call Mexico third world country, 
you know, not everyone identifies. I use the words that, you know, because we do have political, economical, drug, da, 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 all of it challenges. And so we, we just, we're people who are incredibly resilient and incredibly beautiful and incredibly full of joy of life. But we also have layers underneath what you see of a lot that needs to be healed. So for, for you, like in direct is get educated, amp your compassion and ask questions and connect with people who can, you know, continue the conversation with you. Brilliant. Thank you both so much again for your time and your hearts and your experience. Um, thank you to all who do make this series possible. And most importantly, thank you to all of our listeners for showing up today, holding space, deeply listening and bringing forward your mm. questions. We, we truly are stronger together. Um, I just want to note that next Monday at the same time, we have uh, self-liberation through somatic therapy coming up with Melina McConnell, which I'm very excited about as a somatic experiencing practitioner myself. Um, and to learn more about Mental Health Monday and all of our upcoming sessions, please do visit sherecovers.org forward slash mental health Mondays. And for more information about She Recovers Foundation and all of our recovery focused programming resources and touch points, uh, please do visit sherecovers.org. So thank you all again beautiful. for being here. I'm thank deeply you. Grateful. Deeply grateful and grateful for everyone. And, and don't, we didn't respond to all of the little comments on the chat, but I'm, I'm keeping my eye on them. I'm so grateful. I'm apologizing for the F-bombs, but apparently they like them. So, you know, sorry, I'm very, I'm just very me. <laughs> and that's my, my, my other language, the F-bombs. But, but, you know, and Miriam, I love you. Thank you.